for the rest of us, we had to figure out a way of sort of deciding what we were doing and that what we were doing was worth something politically. And so that was kind of the first step of that, to use the best work that you had to back up a political cause. I'm Ben Davis, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Any short list of the most important art critics of the last decades would have to include Lucy R. Lepard. She would also be at the very top of my personal list of favorite writers about art. Lepard has written numerous important books, including Six Years, The Dematerialization of the Art Object from 1973, the book that defined for many what conceptual art was all about as well as volumes like Mixed Blessings, New Art in a Multicultural America, The Pink Glass Swan, Selected Essays on Feminist Art, and The Lure of the Local, Senses of Place in a Multicentered Society, each helping set the agenda for a different moment. But Lepard has also been much more than a writer. She curated Eccentric Abstraction in 1966, helping define what would come to be called post-minimalism in sculpture. Her experimental and traveling card shows helped create the audience for conceptual, minimal, and land art. She curated maybe the first museum show of second-wave feminist art at the Aldrich Museum in 1971 and was a part of the founding Mother Collective behind Heresies, a journal that shaped the field of feminist art history. Radicalized by 60s activism, she participated in the Art Workers Coalition, a historic activist formation protesting against the Vietnam War and for equality in the museum world. She was part of many, many other collectives and activist groups thereafter, including the Artist's Call Against U.S. Intervention in Central America in the early 1980s, a project I talked with her about already for an earlier episode of The Art Angle when there was a show about it at Tufts in 2022. Now Lepard has written a new book called Stuff instead of a memoir. It's a short, packed tome that surveys an eventful life through photos that catalog the items Lepard finds around her in the home where she has lived since moving from New York to the small town of Galisteo in rural New Mexico in the early 90s. It's a fitting way to tell the story of a writer who has thought so much about how images and words fit together and how meaning emerges from place and community. Lucy Lepard, I'm so honored to be talking with you today. It's mutual. So... I'm sitting here surrounded by my collection of Lucy Lepard books, The Pink Glass Swan and The Lure of the Local and many others that have been influential on me. But the occasion for us to talk is this new book, Stuff Instead of a Memoir. Right at the beginning of the book, you write about not wanting to write a memoir or a biography for that matter. So tell me the story behind this book. How did you decide on this form for the book? Well, people have been nagging me to write a memoir or something for years, and it's not something that appeals to me. For me, a memoir is like drama and what have you, and I didn't want to reveal any drama in my life. There's been some. And then I had the idea years ago to base it on the things in the house, which was a different house, I think, at that point, 30, 40 years ago. So that's what I ended up doing. But it's not really based on a lot of the things that I've owned because I gave a huge amount of my art and tchotchkes and all kinds of stuff to the Contemporary Museum in Santa Fe, now called New Mexico Museum of Art. So a lot of the sort of most important or best or whatever things are not in the house, and I didn't include those in the book. And then the book kind of woozled off into something else, but there's a lot of stuff. And I had the idea for the general design, and then I worked with a friend, Michael Motley, who's a professional designer and who made it work. You call it a tell-very-little memoir instead of a tell-all memoir, but there's still a lot in it. For something that is not a tell-all, it's a tell-a-lot. It takes the form of these items from your house in New Mexico that sort of tell the story of your life and actually really, you know, your family and the various causes you've been a part of that involve art but go considerably beyond it. Was there a process of laying out the book, like laying out all these items, or did this the story kind of emerge from the stuff around you? The story emerged and the stuff was kind of crammed into it, <laughs> thanks to the designer and also my kind of assistant. It was a friend named Mira Borak who took a lot of the photography. And so I had a lot of help with this thing in terms of the book itself. 
just to get right into the story you tell in the book, you grew up between a lot of places, between Maine, New Orleans, Virginia, and New York, and you ended up studying at Smith in the late 1950s, where you studied art history. You say in the book, mainly because you wanted the junior year trip to Paris, which strikes me as very you. The interest in art is kind of led by a curiosity about the world. But I did want to know what kind of art history was being taught at Smith at that time and what kind of art history fired your imagination? No, if it so much fired my imagination, but uh, it was a well-known art historian guy and his wife who taught. And, you know, I liked art. My parents were Sunday painters and went to museums. And so I was sort of raised with art, not the kind of art I write about so much. I mean, we sort of stopped with John Maron, a favorite of theirs. The main painter. Yeah. Yeah, the main painter. But then when I went to Paris, my mother had been in Paris and she was a congregational minister's daughter. And I think Paris for her was an incredible opening, probably less so for me because I was raised very differently. I ended up being a total agnostic, but anyway, opened a hell of a lot up for me too. And I, of course, saw a lot of art. I met artists. The first time I'd ever really known contemporary artists at all. And that was a big deal. I mean, I realized quite soon that art history, I mean, as such, was not my favorite thing. Early in your career, you published kind of collections on the Surrealists and Dada. And you you talk in this book that those were your people and then you were done with them. (laughs) Yeah. When I worked at the Museum of Modern Art Library under Bernard Carpell, who was the librarian, he was also a Dada enthusiast. I called him my professional Dada. And he was a kind of avuncular guy from Queens, a real sweetheart and really smart. And I think he probably had more influence than I give him credit for. I shelved all the books in the modern library after the 1958 fire. And shelving books, if you like to read and like art, you kind of open them up and look at them a bit and so on. So I got an amazing education in contemporary art by working at MoMA. Yeah, you owe it all to the MoMA fire uh, (laughs) in some ways. Yeah, so you come to New York in 1958, doing odd jobs like a lot of people do, and you're trying to write fiction, though. You come back from Paris like thinking of yourself as a fiction writer. What turned you to art writing? The fact that I wasn't very good at fiction writing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I, I had gotten prizes in the eighth grade in high school and in college for writing fiction, and I thought I was hot shit, but turns out that I really wasn't that good at writing the kind of fiction I like. Actually, a collection of my fiction is coming out from new documents soonish and sometime in early 24. And it goes from the early stuff that was all rejected that I tried to get into the New Yorker and Red Book and Cosmopolitan and all these weird places that I didn't actually read. But uh, anyway, so we put the whole panoply in there. And then it went into really experimental stuff, which is very hard to read and not the kind of thing I like to read. But there it is. Soon I will be a published fiction writer. (laughs) So you're in New York in the late 50s, and what was the art scene like at that time that you came into? Well, I didn't know much about what I was coming into, but it was the heyday of 10th Street. So I went to a lot of galleries. I met some artists. I must have had some idea by then that I was probably not going to be a fiction writer. But, But after the first year or so of rejection letters, I think I knew that. And then the art was really grabbing me. I knew artists. First, I lived with a uh, an AWOL Navy guy who had quit the Navy to make a public protest about peace, and they never caught him until it was too late to make that protest and so forth. Then I got involved with artists. So I learned everything I know about art from artists, I'm always saying then. Yeah, you write in the book, I was never much of an art historian. By that time, this is the early 60s, I knew that I was more interested in art that was making history now than in history already made. And... Yeah, you got involved or you're around or close with all these artists who were exploring new media at that time and were making new conceptual styles of art, like Saul DeWitt, who was also another person who worked at the Museum of Modern Art on the night desk, as you point out in the book. And you eventually married Robert Ryman, who's an experimental painter of that time. I guess I was just wondering, that is a specific moment when kind of maybe the center of attention does change from the past to the present. I mean, it's when like kind of art forum gets cooking and is focusing on just the art of the present instead of art history. And uh, all these new styles are happening. There's starting to be an art scene in New York. So in retrospect, it all looks very clear that this was like a key moment. But I think that probably is in retrospect and not something that you exactly know as it's happening. 
people have often on said to me, oh, how did you know way ahead of time what was happening? I didn't know way ahead of time. I was just in studios. Duh. I mean, it's where you've got to be is studios. I wasn't waiting till somebody else wrote about stuff. I was in studios and, and they were mostly friends. I mean, it was Saul who sort of introduced me. Bob wasn't heavily social, but Saul knew a lot of people and was very supportive of everybody, especially once he got known himself. In the same passage, there's a line that really stuck out to me. You said, I've always been an advocate, not an adversary. I describe myself as a writer, activist, and sometimes curator. I write about what I like, saving my criticism for capitalism. Is that a personal temperament question for you? Or do you think that there's something larger that's bad about the role of the critic as a negative figure or the role of judgment in art writing? Yeah, well, that was really just not something I wanted to do. Although there were times when artists were really nasty to me, the Greenbergians, where I really felt like I should get out there and do a diatribe. I did now and then. I said when I didn't like something, when I was writing for Art International regularly, I had to review some things that I didn't like because I was assigned. I don't think I was ever terrifically nasty, but I think it's probably temperamental as much as anything. Yeah, because there is like this idea of art critics as gatekeepers who like are kind of like setting the standards of quality, like keeping people out, which is a different role than the advocate. Although I suppose Clement Greenberg, who was the big guy right there, he's most famous as an advocate, right? You know, he almost kind of to a fault to the point of, you know, being unable to see what else was going on. Yes. I mean, I won't get into my Greenbergian diatribe, but I was certainly a gate opener, I think. I've always liked writing the first article on people. I'm, I'm not interested in writing yeah. people who've been written about endlessly and probably more intelligently or more detailed than I would ever do. So just introducing somebody is really what I love to do. There's an interesting character in the book, minor character in, in the story is Hilton Kramer, who did give you some early advice, but was also, you know, later on, basically an antagonist. You know, he wrote about you in 1982, the new Criterion. One of the saddest cases is that of the critic Lucy Lepard. There was every reason to believe that a writer of this quality would one day become one of our leading historians of the modern movement. But he said you got sucked into the radical whirlwind in the 60s. So yeah, what was that relationship like? And what was the advice from him? I always wanted to use that as a blurb for one of my books because I thought it was a wonderful <laughs> statement, but none of the publishers would go for it. So uh, it was very good advice. I sent him some things as soon as I got to New York because I thought, I'm a writer. I can do this. And of course, it was really ignorant about the art world. And he just advised me. He said, you write well. And when you've been around for a while, then you should start writing. And I was so like, oh, my God, I didn't do anything for about four years. I didn't submit anything. And that was a very good idea. In the meantime, I was getting an education, hanging out in studios and got to know what I was writing about. And then the other big influence on my writing, which I don't know if I did justice to this in the book or even mentioned it, was when my father, who was smart and loved art, and he said if he'd just known about art when he was coming up as a working class kid, he might have ended up in art instead of being a doctor and a medical educator and so forth. But he said to me when I started writing for Art International, he was very proud of me. And he said, um, this is interesting, but I don't really understand what you're talking about. And I thought, do I really want to alienate, you know, all my yeah. non-inner art world audience? And I thought, no. And so I slowly managed to have a clearer style, I think. And that was very important to me. That's fascinating because between those two figures, Hilton Kramer and your dad, you know, that is the ultra inside and the, <laughs> and the outside. And with regard to what you were just saying just now about the value of clarity and not talking down to the audience or finding a language to communicate with them, I mean, you are really associated with conceptual art. I mean, one of your most famous books is Six Years, has a much longer title that's almost like an experimental poem itself. But title, you year, hundred uh, words, I think, in the title or something like that. That really gave people a way to hold on to what had happened in the late '60s around conceptualism, and I think today in the mainstream press and just pop culture, when people say the word conceptual art, they basically mean it as a synonym for elitist, academic, kind of ridiculous, over-intellectual art. And you, as an advocate, are just this famously clear writer and famously um, advocate of reaching popular audiences. And that energy is really part of conceptual art. There's this really kind of optimistic idea of creating new ways to talk to people. So 
Yeah, I was just wondering if you would talk a little bit about that, like what the hopes for conceptual art in that time period were. My definition of conceptual art has always been much stricter. I'm horrified to hear you say that it's now considered elitist. (laughs) I don't keep up enough to know that, but dear God, most of the conceptual artists that I hung out with anyway were trying desperately not to be elitists and trying to reach out and and, uh, reach more people and so forth and so on. I mean, obviously, that was kind of pie in the sky, given a lot of their work. (laughs) But let's, Let's face it. I mean, a lot of it just belonged in the art world anyway and remained in the art world where it belonged pretty much rather than being outgoing. But but at the time, I saw it as A, as outgoing, and B, as a writer, a lot of the work was textual and I could participate more. I did some things with the artists as I was allowed to do. One of the weirdest ones was Bob Barry asked me to write a review, and that was the show, I think. And it was a piece that I ended up by making a lot of money off it. I was absolutely amazed in the 2000s sometime. He sent me a big check and he'd always said that if he ever sold the piece, I could have half of it because of the review was mine. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah. And when the time came, I got this big check and he said he thought this was underpriced. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it, that stuff all ended up in the art world when it came right down to it. But I was grateful, I must say. And also in about 69 to 70 one or something, 70. I lived with Seth Siegelaub and he was a genius about- Yeah, this is the great dealer, the most famous dealer of conceptual art. Yeah, and I never think of him as a dealer because he was a very bright guy. He had been a rug dealer and he became a sort of art dealer and quite successfully because he was smart. But when he thought of ways to bypass the usual, you know, you show something, you go from a critic to maybe a gallery to maybe a museum- to maybe a retrospective and so forth and so on. I mean, that's a sort of art world trajectory for success. And he's found a way of bypassing that by publishing things in little books or in booklets and magazines and so forth that got the art out without all of that stuff going on. And the idea was that the artists wouldn't have to kiss ass all the time and they could be freer and do what they wanted. And to some extent that worked because some of this work would never have even passed as art before conceptualism as the movement went. Yeah, it's kind of whole idea of like, you know, you could communicate with people in different ways. It didn't have to look a specific kind of way. You could find stuff that looked like stuff people were familiar with and you could do mail art, like communicate across broader geographies. And I mean, your life has kind of been defined by a lot of travel between places. And there were like international networks of people who emerged through conceptual art that probably wouldn't have be in touch with each other otherwise, right? Well, that's how I got involved in because I had a kid. I, I didn't have any money. I couldn't travel and so forth. So the text part of it worked very well. 1968 is a real key year in this book, in your personal journey, because you go to Argentina to jury this prize and come into contact with radical Latin American art, which is a pretty important transformative experience, right? Yeah. It wasn't like I even met most of those artists or anything, and I never managed to get to the place they were working and everything. But I just never heard anybody say it's more important to make the world better than to make art because the artist friends that I had thought making art was more important. And that was just a moment for me. And I was grateful for that. And then I came back and fell into the Artworks Coalition and so forth. This is a very famous installation, political agitprop a work called Tucumán Burns, right, that was advocating for rights of the people in the face of dictatorship in Argentina. And it was experimental, and it does resonate with a lot of the political art that started picking up when you got back to New York, right? Yeah. I didn't realize there wasn't a direct connection. Well, I met with some of the artists in between Rosario and or Tucumán, wherever they were, Rosario, I think, and Buenos Aires. And so we had lunch or drinks or something. And so I talked to them. And so that was how I knew about it. I never saw the actual art. No. Yeah. So you come back converted to sort of a political form of conceptualism. I mean, you do this famous anti-war fundraiser at Paula Cooper Gallery in 1968 of artists that I don't think people maybe today associate with like activism in some ways. I mean, it's kind of amazing what you put together. Robert Hewitt, who'd already been politicized and, uh, 
Ron Wolin, who was the Socialist Workers Party, and I got together. Paula must have instigated this on some level. Like either we went to her, I can't remember how that all happened, but they were both, I think, more political than I was, or they knew more about being political than I did. And the show was primarily major minimalist artists. And the idea and the statement we wrote, which was a really nice statement, which I can't remember exactly, but it said something to the effect of by presenting the best work we can do, we are backing up our politics. And sort of. So that was an interesting idea that didn't stick with me much. Then there became this whole business about my art is my politics. And right. to some extent, that was absolutely true. The people who didn't want to have anything to do with politics, their art was their politics. It was the status quo was their politics. And the Vietnam War, of course, was triggering all of this. For the rest of us, we had to figure out a way of sort of deciding what we were doing and that what we were doing was worth something politically. And so that was kind of the first step of that, to use the best work that you had to back up a political cause. The Vietnam War and also the murder of Martin Luther King in that same year, you write in this book about, you know, hearing the news in the same room with Kynaston Machine, who was a curator who did a very famous show called Information that you also worked on, which was a key show for international conceptualism. Well, it was amazing. Yeah, the MoMA came up with this and the Kynaston got away with it. I mean, Yeah. And you write about being with him when the news comes in and, you know, he has to go up to Harlem to experience this. Even though Kenneth was not the world's most leftist person. Right. But certainly was as moved as I've ever seen him by something that could be considered political. Well, I think that's actually important that there is a moment when the politics was just like bursting through all the structures that otherwise, you know, weren't very receptive to them. And this is the time when, I mean, there's a tremendous amount that happens in the late 60s. There's all the activism, the Art Workers Coalition. I've always loved your text on that, the Art Workers Coalition, not a history as the most amazing text about what it's like to organize with artists and how chaotic and messy it can be. And then at the same time, you're also doing all these shows, your card shows around the traveling, which are these kind of conceptual art shows that involve artworks that are essentially printed on textually on cards, right? Well, no, the artworks weren't. The first shows, 5570 something or other and 988 something. The names of the populations of the cities where they're shown in. Heavy conceptual influence. I mean, names that you can never remember. But the first shows anyway in Seattle and Vancouver were great big museum shows. And they Mm -hmm. included a whole lot of outdoor stuff, which people weren't really doing at that point, as well as something like Bob Barry's invisible gases or something. I mean, or just one line of text. So it went the whole spectrum of conceptual minimal stuff. I mean, Robert Ryman was in it and Eva Hesse, I think. But then the next two shows, one in Buenos Aires and one in uh, that traveled all over the place, started at Cal Arts. They were more conceptual. Although the women's show, which was the Cal Arts one, it was hung. I mean, there was stuff in galleries and so on. So the cards, I told every artist, okay, you've got a card talk about your work in the show. Of course, we did the cards ahead of the show, so they changed their minds, and I had to execute a lot of the work because there was no money to bring the artists there. It was kind of chaotic, to say the least. (laughs) If you ever want to interview anybody about those shows, Anne Folk in Washington State was my really amanuensis for all of that, and she sort of took over when I left and got the show up, and she took over maintaining a lot of this stuff, conceptual things that had to be kept track of and so forth. Anyway, she's wonderful. Well, I guess what I wanted to ask you is, so you're at the kind of at the heart of the action, both in terms of like being involved in a lot of really important political actions in and against the art world. And then also in terms of these shows that are advocating, as you do, for new artists. But it's actually a little after that, that you kind of discover the feminist art movement. It's amazing to me that you're involved in all this and then you write about this realization that you're not one of the boys, how you put it in the book. So, yeah, was there a moment? What was the epiphany? <laughs> I guess it was writing this the experimental novel, the only published novel I've ever done that, called I See Slash You Mean. But basically, I mean, I knew about the feminist movement because there was a group called War in the Art Workers Coalition, Women Artists in Revolution. They weren't exactly my bag for some reason. They didn't do it for me. I mean, I mean, I was sympathetic, but I wasn't involved because I thought I was one of the boys. Then I went to Spain and was writing a, this novel. and 
you know, when you're writing fiction, you really have to think. <laughs> Unlike our criticism, they don't have to think all that much. <laughs> but uh, the fiction, you have to sort of look into yourself more. And then I thought, oh, my God. I think I'm a feminist. <laughs> so it was really that book. But then I came back and the actual trigger was Poppy Johnson, Brenda Miller and Faith Ringgold were starting something already. And I joined and we did the Ad Hoc Women Artists Committee. And now that's one of, I mean, I think it would be one of your major contributions is to really uh, so firmly put that into the center of the conversation of art criticism. I thought it was interesting uh, in this section, you talk about being initially resistant to the, what you call the California idea that there was a specific kind of women's art. And I think that's pretty common, right? I mean, like a lot of women artists from before the 1970s, like are just dead set against being advocated for that way. And then there is a real shift with second wave feminism in the 1970s. Well, I had known Judy Chicago in the 50s. Right. That's amazing. You met her, you know, really early. Oh, she was Judy Chicago. <laughs> and uh, we were all hanging out on the Lower East Side and avant-garde situation, sort of. And her husband used to come to the modern and and he was a writer and he could get into the modern free if he came up to me in the library and I put him in the other elevator and he went down and he was in the museum without paying. A lot of my friends from the Lower East Side did that. They wondered why I had so many people visiting me when I was only a page in the library. So anyway, but I didn't know anything about her art. I was really more friends with him because he was a writer, but we'd known each other and she's never forgotten some of my peculiarities at the time. <laughs> but you did come around. I mean, you talk about Chicago and Miriam Shapiro who were really associated at this time with kind of building the feminist art movement on the West Coast, basically converted you, yeah? In a way, I think the artists converted me just as much. But they came in April 71. I did a women's show at uh, the Aldrich Museum, and they came and saw it. And I said, well, you know, that stuff of yours doesn't really work here. And they went, ha, 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 and pointed out to me that in some cases it didn't really work for that much in the show because so much of it was New York, you know, minimalism public art, that kind of thing and so on. But they certainly made an inroad in the whole thing. And I began to really look more closely. Another thing that happened was Pat Steer. I don't know if she will remember this, but she was against this whole business of central imagery and mm -hmm. kinds of things that Judy and Mimi were talking about. And one time she rang the bell at my loft and said she's left something downstairs for me. And so I went down to get it and it was a roll of her old work that had all of these things in it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's like just explicitly, you know, yeah. about the female yeah. body there artwork. There was that sort of central imagery and some of the things that they were talking about at the time, which I thought was very sweet of her. I mean, <laughs> she said, here, you take this, you deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, um, one side of your work that I totally didn't know about before I read this book was about your comics. You recreate a panel of one of your feminist comic books in the book on page 71 it's like this line drawing and the center is like a drawing of an oil painting that's depicting like a nude woman and a man threatening the model with a knife and then on the left there's a drawing of a woman with a talking balloon saying what do you mean ironic and the male figure on the right says well what do you mean insulting so uh, you talk about how after your feminist conversion you describe a moment when you thought of selling your feminist comics on the street corners where did this come from i didn't ever finish a whole comic or anything i did some illustrations for things and so on but the heroine was polly tickle uh -huh. and the uh, author was lucy the lip which i think jerry allen had called me at one point she's responsible for the lucy the lip thing but i was just unfortunately too busy to go on with that i, I kind of wish I had done a whole comic, but I've always liked comics. And I was raised with the New York Times, which had no comics. And so now in my hometown newspaper, the Santa Fe New Mexican, has comics. And to this day, I go there first every single morning. <laughs> so I've always enjoyed comics. And, and They do kind of exist at the convergence of, you know, text and image and populism. You know, it really is a kind of a crystal in some ways of your interest. And you did curate, you know, a show, uh, Who's Laughing Now, right, about like comic-inspired art at a certain point in the meeting space of the Union 1199, according to this book. I did several shows there. Mo Foner, who kind of ran, I guess, the cultural branch of the Union, let me in for some reason. And, and Jerry Kearns and I did, a, I think, a show there. I did the Hans Hacke show that was canceled at the Guggenheim Museum and the right, right. curator was fired and so forth. It shows you at that time how um, art with political content was not I think in that case, uh, the Guggenheim shut Hans Hacke out because they said it was like an alien entity in the museum. 
So we were all for the aliens getting in on some level. <laughs> some activist artists would say, we, we don't want to be at museums, fuck it. And then Leon Golub pointed it out to us, and he was older than a lot of us. And, and he said, uh, our art is good. It does belong in museums. So don't just get out of museums on that level. Try to get into museums. And that, that was very interesting. I think it influenced quite a lot of people. Not that we got into that many museums, but uh, we tried, I guess. Well, I have to say on that subject that this book has a very characteristic, to me, Lucy Lepard tone. It's clear and frank about your political convictions, but there's also this kind of modesty, sometimes a rueful tone. This line really stood out to me. You said, I love the certainty of being a lefty activist. I believed we were right and had trouble understanding why everybody didn't agree with us and why some of those who did still wouldn't join us thanks to the complexities and nuances of everyone's lives. And, you know, I've been reading another essay by you from the collection Art Matters, which is about the culture wars in the 90s. It's called Too Political, Forget About It. You talk there really interestingly about the project of political art in the 80s and early 90s and some of its unapologetically, but also about some of its limits, how it failed to break out of the art audience. And I just think that's a really interesting thing. And what are some of the lessons you take about art and politics from trying to navigate this terrain? I don't know. The times are so different now and social media has made such a difference and I don't do social media. So I'm really uneducated about a lot of stuff. My activism has been very local for the last 30 years. And so I'm not really sure where to go with that. Given the impressive demonstrations that are going on about the death of Mm -hmm. Gaza, that's so interesting because a lot of it is art oriented and and a lot of artists are in there. Younger artists are in there. I wish my grandsons were doing more about that. But uh, anyway, my partner's major political issue is he's been involved with something called Santa Fe's for Justice in Palestine for many years now. And he speaks some Arabic and he's taught at the University of Khartoum at one point and so on. So anyway, so I'm better oriented with a lot of that stuff than I was, although I look back and I found a couple of Palestinian things I did long before I knew him. So at least I was on the right side. I think there are a lot of artists out there probably who I've never heard of who are doing really wonderful work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, I meant the need to like push art, you know, to have your convictions, but then also the way, I don't know, the art world kind of absorbs your convictions (laughs) and turns them into commodities. Although certainly now seems to be some kind of breaking point around this. Is that why you moved to New Mexico in 1993? I mean, you say you were not trying to escape art, you were trying to escape the art world. Well, you know, I don't ever really make decisions. I just kind of wander off into things. My mother died. I didn't have to be in the East anymore. And I had a little money for a change. And I'd love New Mexico. I'd been here first in 1972. And I thought, oh, I'd love to live here. But I can't possibly make a living doing what I want to do here. So I didn't. I love the place. I love the village I live in. and, And we have endless political issues. But they're not the major ones. I mean, Palestine and Israel definitely is a major one. But for the most part, it's about the road that's coming through that's shaking the old adobes and ruining people's houses and why the road has to come through a village and the main highway and so forth and so on. And development and pollution and all kinds of things, which are local. Well, it seems like you've been keep extraordinarily busy writing about art for someone who lives in a tiny town in New Mexico. And... On the other hand, you also edit a local community newsletter, El Puente. Well, I write it. You, you, you write it everything. and edit it. Uh, and stand it and sticker it and mail it. And <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that because it, it's you loom so large in my mind as somebody who's had this big impact on art and made me think about what it even means to work in art as an environment. And then here you are writing this community newsletter. But I was thinking maybe this is like, you know, you've written kind of ruefully at one point in six years about the failure of conceptual art of its populist promise. But then I was thinking, well, maybe this community newsletter is almost like that kind of promise in a different form. I mean, it's like a way to work to actually form a kind of alternate network of people, keep people together, uh, share information and culture. Maybe, you know, that's The point of all this is is something as simple as that. Yeah, well, it certainly is where I've ended up. I'm still writing about art and, of course, I'm still making a living at it. But I'm writing more, I notice as I'm almost 87, as I creep on, I'm writing more about friends and uh, I can be more choosy about what I'm writing about. I'm not writing about art world stuff 
but in, in a way, it's still the same thing, trying to introduce people into the art world and how much the art world sees most of what I write now. I don't know. It tends to be catalogs and things. But it's true that the art community has always been a sort of strange one. I mean, you have close friends and you have people whose work you like, and they're not always the same people. And then you have friends who make it and friends who don't make it and so forth. And by the time I left New York, I didn't feel like there was that much of a community left. Yeah. The activist community was kind of sloughing off. And so here, it was so nice to find something I could do that I'm good at. I'm in, still in the auxiliary of the fire department, which means I do stupid things, but not anything I'm good at. <laughs> and editing the newsletter is something I, I really love. Your epigraph for this book stuff is from John Berger. And I always tell people that my favorite two critics or the most important two critics to me are Lucy Lepard and John Berger. And one of the thing I realize is that both of you at a certain point left the art world, you know, you for New Mexico and he left London for, I think, rural Switzerland at a certain point. I just wonder, what does that mean for me? You know, is this just like ultimately intolerable contradiction to be at the center of this stuff? Where you can do what you do from whatever little town, the Hudson Valley, everybody's in the Hudson Valley now. So. I suppose so. Well, towards the end of the book, you say this might be your last book, but you also mention a long planned collection of essays on monuments and contested histories, which does seem like a very vital uh, topic of the now. I'm curious about what you have cooking. Well, I feel I've outlived both my parents and my family's not long lived. And I thought, eh, that's probably my last book. But then recently, a friend who's an artist who lives here part time, she had an old friend of hers who is a Colombian drag queen, who's a filmmaker too, visiting. And he didn't know what I did. And he said he wanted to do my tarot. So he did my tarot and he said, oh, you have another eight or nine years. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll try another book. <laughs> but the monuments thing, I had started it several years ago because it was called The Burden of Memory. But then uh, so many good books started coming out about monuments. Rebecca Zorak has just published a really good book. So I thought, well, I think monuments has been done well enough. And it was going to be a series of essays anyway. So I've, now the book, which I haven't really started except for what I had left for the monument stuff, is called Whose Histories? Question mark. It's in response to all this critical race theory and wokeism and all this denial and erasure of our histories. The lovely thing about writing about art that I've always found is that I get a brainstorm or I think I'm going to do such and such, and I can always find artists who are working on these subjects. So I haven't even started really researching the artists, all of the monuments. I have a huge file on the monuments, and that'll be a part of it, but not the whole thing. So I think I'll try it. We'll see if I survive to do it. <laughs> well, finally, you say in this book, you write about art being perceived as either above it all that is often an elite cloud, or below it all, that is bourgeois frippery, not worth considering. And I guess I feel that navigating that tension is a big theme of this book, and I think it's exactly something that a lot of people struggle with today. They're very charged times, but also very unequal times, uh, very commodified art world. So do you have any advice? Do you think it's possible to find a right balance between those two things? Or has it just been a constant zigzag between them? Well, the zigzag is certainly there. That's what I ought to call my memoir, zigzag. <laughs> it's better than stuff. But you know, your life leads you certain ways and you find out you can do such and such or not do such and such, or you get turned down for something, you turn to something else. It's not something I can really advise anybody without knowing their own lives. I think, you know, life really is the important part of it. I always love that quote, art is what makes life more important than art. I have quoted that all the time. I mean, I know for artists, it's totally central. For me, it's not totally central. Well, I mean, I think that's fine advice. Comes back to my first thesis about this book that I mean, really does goes back to studying art history because you want to go to Paris, you know, that the life guides the interest, not the other way around. It's really an uh, illuminating book, and it's a very generous book. You know, you're very generous to people you've worked with. I think that's characteristic of your method. It's been a real delight talking to you. Well, thank you, and I admire what you do, too. That is it for this week's show. If you like what you have heard, you can get more of it all the time by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, or any of the other more niche services that I don't even know about. Also, take a moment to read and review us. That helps other people 
find what we're doing, and that's a good thing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Next week.